we are going to hear from Tony, Tony Morse, who has been active with the Schiller Institute since about 1988. He, uh, just retired as a conductor and uh, conducted uh, the first major experiment that was done, uh, to the best of my knowledge anyway, in the United States, uh, taking uh, an opera and using the corrected or proper tuning of C at 256 cycles per second. This was an experiment that we did first, I believe, was 1989, and then in 1990, uh, he was the conductor for a concert opera performance of Beethoven's Fidelio, which was also done at C256. Uh, Tony has, uh, is also now a board member of the Foundation for the Revival of Classical Culture, and he's going to speak on the topic Schiller and Universal History. Thank you very much. Then it said, keep it short. <laughs> so that means we're going through the Louvre on roller skates. <laughs> I hope you had a good look at the portrait of Schiller over William Wurtz's left shoulder. That's my favorite single picture of him. And what it reveals is uh, that is a face of a noble warrior. The obviously great man. Some people who are great don't look it. You would have passed Mozart on the street without a second look. <laughs> However, Scheller is obviously a very great man. His birthday is actually last Wednesday, November 10th, but it's as good to be celebrating it now. He was born in Marburg, a part of Württemberg, and he died in Weimar uh, at 46 years later in 1805. A shortish life, of course, but of phenomenal achievement in several different disciplines. It was a life of extraordinary achievement, as I say, in difficult times, phenomenal. As a, as a child, he showed such enormous intelligence early on that his father, who was a professional soldier in the service of the Duke of Württemberg, brought um, uh, to the Duke's attention this extraordinary talent. And Schiller, as a young child, was a wonderful preacher. He had terrific temperament. The red hair might prepare you for that. And it's amazing to me to think that there was this very eloquent child preaching the gospel at a, a quite a young age without any attempt on his parents to produce this, by the way. He wished to study for the priesthood. But the Duke said absolutely no, and insisted that since he was so bright, he should, thank you, <clears throat> he should study both medicine and law at the same time. And being a polymath genius, he mastered them both completely, as to what was known at least in those times of medicine. And at age 21, he became the principal surgeon of a regiment of soldiers in the service of uh, the Duke of Württemberg. Also in his 20s, he wrote his first play, which is called Die Räuber, The Robbers. And it was put on in a neighboring city, and it was a stunning success. Young Friedrich asked the Duke for leave to attend his own play and it was refused. He went anyway, <laughs> showing early on that he could battle against repression and was, of course, imprisoned when he returned. Um, in addition, the Duke gave him a vicious tongue lashing, forbidding him from ever writing another word of literature in his whole life. This to one of the two greatest figures in German literary history. <clears throat> well, of course, he wasn't going to put up with that. Um, so uh, he managed a kind of Douglas Fairbanks Jr. escape from the jail, leaving Württemberg and living in various cities of Germany 
for some years under an assumed name for fear of extradition to uh, Württemberg. Finally, he was safe and famous, if poor. He fell in love uh, with a young lady and asked her father for her hand in marriage and was scornfully refused and advised to f p take a different career that paid better than literature. Ultimately, he fell in love again and married a beautiful and noble lady, <coughs> Charlotte von Lengefeld. I have his picture here. Is it possible to, to portray that? The beautiful lady on the, on the table in front of you is Charlotte von Lengefeld. And she was a very good uh, wife to him, but they did uh, suffer from privation. Um, by the way, she was born noble, he was not, but he was created noble toward the end of his life, the way his friend Goethe was, that he was Friedrich von Schiller. Nice to have the husband and wife on the same social level. Um, at length, uh, Goethe, who was the leading artistic luminary in the Duchy of, of Weimar, recommended that Schiller be hired by the University of Jena as a professor of history. Now, his first lecture there as a professor took as its title, quote, what is and to what end do we study universal history, unquote. His answer was to observe the trends leading to political liberty as being the only state worthy of the dignity of mankind. So, he, as he wrote, quote, the most perfect of all works of art is the establishment of a true political freedom, unquote. The lecture hall was jammed with students eager to hear this famous figure. Um, he became known as the poet of freedom because so many of his great plays, the greatest in Europe, in my opinion, after William Shakespeare's, dealt with the oppressed struggling for their liberty. You think of the Flemish people struggling under the Spanish invaders in Don Carlo, the Swiss working to free themselves from uh, Austrian um, uh, uh, repression in uh, William Tell, written the year of his death and probably his greatest work. Joan of Arc, again, freeing the French from the British rule. So consider the varieties of activity which Schiller distinguished himself. He was a lawyer, a doctor, a keen student of Latin and Greek literature, um, a splendid essayist, a great philosopher poet, um, a supreme playwright, a famous orator, a kindly editor who helped to develop the careers of many young writers, a historian who wrote the definitive account of the Thirty Years' War. That was the disaster which killed off 70% of the urban population of Germany and 40% of the total population. Of course, most people lived in the country, but it would take an atom bomb to do that today. So the, the Germans suffered through that. It was a religious war, the worst kind of war, when the Protestants came down from the north and the Catholics came up from the south, and poor Germany was the battleground. He also reformed the entire educational system of Germany through his disciple, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who just happened to be the Minister of Education for the Prussian state. In short order, the system uh, proposed by Schiller was such a success in Prussia that the other German states adopted it as well. Of course, they weren't to be joined together politically until 1870, the Franco-Prussian War. But it made the German-speaking people the most educated in the world and for some time and produced so much invaluable research that scholars in other countries had to know German to be aware of the new developments in their own field. In the early 20th century, uh, an American university whose name I don't recall off the top of my head, it's not a, one of the big ones, um, celebrated an important anniversary by uh, hosting a festival of psychology to which it invited Sigmund Freud who was being talked about a lot in Europe at that time, in Vienna. He gave on five successive days, five lectures to packed and overflowing professional audiences. Alles auf Deutsch. 
all in German, with his hearers uh, understanding every bit of it. The five lectures were a sensation and established Freudianism in the United States. And that's an example of how, of how important it was for any scholar um, to know German. I remember reading a biography of William James, who was at that same conference, by the way. And he said he was working very, very hard on his German. Had to. You couldn't keep up with scholarship in, in your field if you didn't know German. As part of his philosophical system, he advised raising the moral tone of the people by presenting to them great works of art, which would entice them by the surface beauty of the art, thereby encouraging them to identify themselves with the moral and spiritual values inherent in all truly great art. Now, uh, note well, he did not suppose that people would be made automatically better by the surface attractions of art, but at least familiarity with art would get a foot in the door, so to speak, and encourage the kind of personal moral choice essential to all real virtue. Schiller's legacy was vast and beneficent, and not just in his own magnificent poetry and plays and education reforms. <clears throat> when he was studying to write his definitive account of the Thirty Years' War, he investigated with particularly, uh, particular fascination the military tactics and strategy of the many battles and polymath genius that he was. He became an expert in this specialty and shared this knowledge with a close relative of his wife Charlotte's, Heinrich von Wolzogen, a military officer who had fought in a battle with Napoleon and uh, met him in the humiliating peace negotiations that followed. Von Wolzogen was a military aide to a Prussian princess who married a Russian Grand Duke and the whole, moved her whole entourage to Moscow. Now, this is important for world history, as you will now discover. Von Wolzogen found himself in court circles which included the Tsar and his supreme military commander, Marshal Kutuzov. Von Wolzogen convinced both of these men that if they confronted Napoleon directly, they would lose the battle and eventually you lose their entire country. They were very unhappy about this idea because they said, if we don't engage Napoleon, our people will think of us as cowards. And von Volkelsogen said, that may be as, as, as it may be, but if you engage him directly, you'll lose their, your whole country. That would be absolutely irre irredeemable. Remembering Schiller's military strat strategy lessons, Volkelsogen convinced the Russians to retreat and retreat and let the Russian winter destroy Napoleon. And so it turned out. Napoleon marched into uh, Russia with 250,000 men and marched out with only 10,000 men before he was caught at the Battle of Leipzig and sent to Elba. Schiller had already died when this happened. This happened in, in 1812. Schiller died in 1805. But we, one cannot help but see, through his disciple von Wolzogen, Schiller's hand reaching up from the grave to pull the tyrant down to destruction. Talk about an influential legacy. In 1805, Schiller died, having fought to stay alive in spite of his advanced tuberculosis in order to complete his legacy of plays, one late masterpiece after another, after another, after another. His close friend Goethe had said to him, Schiller, you do everything wonderfully. Your essays are great. The philosophic poetry is great. But the plays are your major legacy to your people. Give us more plays. The man was so ill that in the autopsy that followed his death, the doctors said, but he couldn't function on any level with the tuber tuberculosis at such an incredibly advanced stage. But he did, and uh, my book about Schiller says that it was a battle between human will and medical condition, and will won over and over again as he produced one late masterpiece after another. His great friend Goethe, who had in recent years adopted a pose of, of marble statue of calm that could not be shaken by anything, Goethe was devastated and didn't get out of bed for a month. But what he did do is produced the most beautiful epitaph that was ever written for any human being. 
that was composed by Goethe for Schiller's grave. And <clears throat> my translation, by the way, I make it four lines. I can't make it in the two, the couplet that Goethe did, but I'll tell you what Goethe said uh, after this. But the translation is, he lights our way ahead with comets glow, disappearing into the supernal, uniting all his radiance as he goes with all the radiance of light eternal. Devastating, devastating. The German takes only two lines to say the same thing. Er glänzt uns vor wie ein Komet entschwinden, unendlich Licht mit seinem Licht verbindend. Great man, I salute him. Let's say all happy birthday, Schiller. Happy birthday, Schiller.